Welcome to Pillars of Society and the fourth in our series of public talks. In this week of International Women's Day, we have two women who are also artists. We're very, very happy to have Sarah Yunan and Vanda Zaborska with us this evening, talking about memory, commemoration and memorialization and artistic forms of protest. Uh, the Enui Adi Emily Loro. My name is Emily Loro and I am Community Art Coordinator at Oriel Martin Gallery. Just to describe myself, I'm a white woman in my 40s and I've got big white glasses and hoop earrings and a grey jumper. This project is funded by the 15 Minute Heritage Grant Programme, a collaboration between the National Lottery Heritage Fund and CADU, the Welsh Government's Historic Environment Service. Hoylan Oithkam Deithas Pillars of Society is an Oriel Marthin Gallery community project. Oriel Marthin Gallery is the main publicly funded art and craft gallery for South West Wales. We are currently closed but there are still lots of things happening. We've just installed a really beautiful exhibition by Helen Booth, and there is a virtual tour, which is available through our social media. We, are, we also have a beautiful podcast series with Ensemble Cymru. Um, just a little bit about the project. Apologies to those of you who've come to all of our talks and have heard this so many times. Um, but for those of you who are new to the project, Hoylian Oithkam Deithas, Pillars of Society, is a project investigating the statues and monuments in the Carmarthen. Specifically, the Picton Monument and the statue of William Knott and their attendant colonial history, the Crimean War Memorial, and two iconic symbols of Welsh identity, the Gorseth Stones and Gwynfor Evans's plaque. The project is a response to the national and international debate around public art and colonial history. Um, we hope it will provide an opportunity to discuss race and racism, equality, diversity, inclusion, Welsh identity, language and independence, and the experience of Wales as colonizer and colonized. It certainly feels this week that it's very important to provide spaces for conversations around race and racism and white fragility. Um, I'm talking about Harry and Meghan, in case you didn't get that. I am going to recommend this book again. It's called White Fragility. And I so recommend this if you are interested in what that means. And Robin D'Angelo, um, the author of this book, has loads of stuff online. Um, she's a white woman, but she talks so precisely and coherently about race and privilege um, and White Fragility. It's a really fantastic book. I so recommend it, especially to white people. Um, so we, on this project, we are working closely with students from Carmarthen School of Art who are participating in a series of workshops with artists and creating ideas for alternative works of public art, which will be displayed via an augmented reality app. There will also be new interpretation of the statues and monuments via QR codes and a walking tour and accompanying map. And we have a Facebook page, dedicated Facebook page for the project. So you can look up Pillars Kaiverden or um, Pillars of Society or Hoylion Oithkam Deithas and you will find it. Um, and all the information uh, about the project is on there. So. I would like to now introduce our first speaker. We're going to have a slightly different format tonight. We're going to have Sarah's talking to us from Kenya and it's quite late over there. So we're going to have Ke Sarah's talk and then Sarah's questions and then a break. And then we're going to have Vanda and questions for Vanda after that. Um, so to introduce Sarah, Sarah works as Youth Engagement Coordinator at Amgiedva Cymru and is particularly interested in socially engaged projects in art and heritage. Sarah was born in Germany, raised in Kenya and moved to Wales in 2009, um, completing her PhD at Cardiff School of Art and Design in 2016. 
Um, as an artist, Sarah has exhibited work in both the UK and abroad and her practice spans performance, ceramics, digital technologies, research and maintenance art. So over to you, Sarah, lovely to have you with us tonight. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, I am currently in Kenya. I still have family here and occasional work projects. So I got stuck on a work trip. Um, not the best time to travel, but Luckily, we're all able to work remotely. Um, I've lived in Wales for 10 years and finished my education there. I have a PhD in art and audience engagement. So I'm not here as a historian. I don't speak as a historian, but I speak as someone who engages communities with heritage. So I sit on the intersection of heritage and people. And as we all know, it's become a bit of a place of um, friction. I work at the National Museum of Wales, where I work as a um, youth engagement coordinator. Um, it's brilliant. In a sense, I'm able to learn from both the past and the future because every day I watch the two of them meet and come together and talk to each other. Currently at the museum, I'm working on a project with young people, which is called um, Reframing Picton. We've got a giant portrait of Picton in the Faces of Wales gallery, and we're looking at sorry, dogs. We're looking at what it means to take an actively anti-racist stance, um, how to deal with our own colonial history in the museum. And um, so I've thought a lot about this particular history. I've thought a lot about Picton. And today we're going to take this as an example to look together um, a little bit at the wider discussion around memorials, heritage and culture. I will touch on some difficult subjects, including torture, but I won't linger too long. I'm um, just warning you, trigger warning. So in 1828, a monument was erected in Carmarthen to honor Lieutenant General Sir Thomas Picton, who died at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. So it was erected in 1828. The pillar was about 23 meters high with a statue of Picton on top. It stood on a square pedestal and apparently could even climb inside through a small door in the back. Um, above the entrance door, there was his name, Picton, and a relief, relief showing him falling from his horse in, at Waterloo. Waterloo was written across the top and the other sides were also decorated with more heroic scenes with his medals and a short account of his life in Welsh and English. That monument didn't last. The weather took it down a few years later. The entire pillar had to be taken down in 1846. After demolition of that first monument, a new structure honoring Picton, an obelisk, was built in 1847. However, in 1984, the top section was declared unsafe and taken down. And four years later, in 1988, the whole monument was rebuilt stone by stone on stronger foundations. So Picton died in 1815. The monument was built in 1828, taken down in 1846 and rebuilt between 1984 and 88. It's hardly of its time. The current memorial was designed by men who had never met Picton one and a half centuries after his death and focused exclusively on his military exploits. Now we know that unlike heroic portraits and memorials, people are not one dimensional. No one is modern dimensional. Picton was certainly a high-ranking military man, but he was also fond of torture and led through fear and intimidation and brutality, both in the army and during his time as governor of Trinidad. He was put on trial in his time for the torture of the child Luisa Calderon, which even in his time was seen as a step too far. Luisa Calderon was a free mulatto girl. Mulatto was the term used at the time in Trinidad, it means of mixed heritage, but she was only free in the sense of not being a slave. She was born in poverty and was given into the household of a white trader in Trinidad at the age of 11 as his concubine, his mistress. Three years later, when she was just 14, her abuser accused her of conspiring with another man to steal money, and he asked for her to be tortured. Picton signed off on the torture of the girl. Um, he had her hung from the ceiling by her arms, tied behind her back with one foot resting on a wooden spike for several hours. She did not confess. And so he had her kept in a small cell where she could barely stand up for another eight months. She still did not confess. When the story broke in the UK and Picton's trial made headlines, she actually came over to the UK to give evidence in court at 14 years old. Luisa returned to Trinidad and was forgotten. And as um, Picton's military career flourished, he was acquitted. 
History also forgot about the many unfree black people picked and had tortured in Trinidad. As a governor, he extended the number of lashes given during regular punishment. He had slaves tortured and killed for insolence, for running away, for being ill, for practicing obia, a mix of ancestral beliefs and traditions such as Risha worship, which was brought over from Nigeria. Those traditions still live today in Trinidadian carnival, as does the memory of slavery chains and lashings. They come out during carnival time and dance in the streets as living memories. Picton was also once deeply infatuated with another Trinidadian mulatto woman called Rosetta Smith. Rosetta was beautiful, she was free, and she was married. She was in her 20s when she was reportedly recruited by Picton's pimps to become his mistress. She left her husband, she left poverty, and she secured business monopolies, lucrative contracts, and influence through her relationship with Picton. Their partnership included catching and reselling runaway slaves and maroons. Maroons are people who escaped slavery and mixed with indigenous population. Effectively, the both of them engaged in profiting from the trade in people. Rosetta even used Picton's accounts and the title of governess of Trinidad or Rosetta Picton on sales documents. A story was recorded where a Welsh widow named Mrs. Rebecca Griffiths and Rosetta fell out over a real estate deal gone sour. And so Rosetta had the widow's house in Trinidad surrounded by Picton soldiers to starve her and her three daughters out of their home. So much for his Welsh nationalism. Rosetta Smith had four children with Picton, which he acknowledged and wrote into his will. Nonetheless, she has been written out from public narratives about him, which focus solely on his military career. So in the same vein, Louisa Calderoni was pushed to the sideline of history. Rosetta Smith was as well. These two free mulatto women were written into the sidelines of history as caricatures. They're seen as seductresses and sinister women who had a negative influence on the career of a brilliant white man. And think about the many unfree people of African descent who've been erased from history entirely. So if the removal of Picton's monument or the changing of its lettering would constitute an erasure of history, as some claim, the history that is at threat here is not the one they claim. Their own version of history is edited. Here's an example of the kind of narrative spun by the former town mayor and Alan Lenny, who is a defender of monuments himself. Picton came to public attention initially for his governorship of Trinidad, as a result of which he was put on trial in England for illegally torturing a woman. This is what he says. I would like to note here that he didn't torture a woman, he tortured a girl and many other unfree men, women, and children. He increased the number of lashes routinely given. <sighs> Lenny also says, Luisa Calderon was not a slave, but a free young woman suspect of assisting one of her lovers to burgle the house of the man with whom she was living, making off with about 500 pound. Again, note how the man she was living with is acquitted and she is not described as a young girl who was routinely sexually abused, but as a woman with many lovers who robbed money. Then he goes on to say, during the trial, Picton was subject to anti-Welsh racist remarks by the English press and public. Although Picton was found guilty, the conviction was later overturned. He then went from zero to hero for his exploits under Wellington in the Peninsula Wars against Napoleon. I find it very strange and unsavory how here anti-Welsh racism is pitted against racial discrimination and brutality inflicted on people of African descent. And Picton himself, as we heard earlier, was not a nationalist and didn't respect um, his own um, Welsh, um, Welsh people living in Trinidad. So, sorry, the reason I delve so deeply into this particular monument, this particular memorization of the flawed figure of Picton as a hero, is to illustrate that memorization is itself flawed. It upholds the aesthetics of white supremacy, patriarchy, military and colonial worldview within public space. And the real problem isn't statues and monuments, but they are a symptom of a larger project. The real conversation has to be about racism and how we confront it. We have to examine the nature of commemorization and memorization itself and how it can create obstacles to a better shared future. We have to explore how to remember a little bit more ethically. Instead of offering a set of competing rationalizations for violence, we have to understand and be honest about the context in which they occurred. When things are set in stone, old views remain certain. 
Before the protests, statues were fre frequently overlooked and forgotten in plain sight, but still present, constant. Set in stone, they remain present, certain and beyond questioning. Monumental sculptural works serve to underpin hierarchical societies and to elevate the memories of those who are already powerful in, in this life. They are built to elevate political and societal myths. In essence, memorization is a form of public, pro pu public propaganda through communal aesthetics. So today the monumental sculpture format has fallen out of um, favor and become outdated. Certainly after it saw its last uptick with nationalist socialist public art in Germany and the socialist monuments of Soviet Russia. Now I am half German, so I am going to go there. Um, 21st century Germany is a nation that largely understands and acknowledges that there are chapters in our history that cannot be uncritically memorialized and that there are figures within the German story whose legacies demand a degree of contextualization that is beyond the capacity of heroic monuments. This insight is a self-awareness, which is important. Um, after the Second World War, Allied Control Council in Berlin pressured authorities of occupied and devastated Germany to have statues removed from public display. So in 1947, British, American and French occupiers concluded that history, or at least its memorization through public statues could indeed be erased. So the Second Reich um, Nazi Germany was enough to change minds about not history, but statues being untouchable and unmovable. And now currently in the UK, are we saying that the colonial empire isn't and doesn't demand a review? Perhaps because the fall from grace in the UK was slow and still continues. Unsettling people who would like to hold on to the myth of a benign and civilizing empire that did much for the world. This would allow structures to stay in place. But we are in a questioning time. Apparently we're going through culture wars or history wars. In the UK questions of what and how we remember have become a national and political conversation with the prime minister himself referring to protesters as bay mobs and the government ordering a review of the national trust which looks at historical houses and properties. Um, the National Trust reviewed its own colonial legacies through the Colonial Countryside um, Project. And I'm so happy today an article came out confirming that the National Trust was just doing its job by reviewing the history of its own houses. It did not break charity law. But this um, commission to question the National Trust itself is worrying. There are clearly factions within the UK governance and society which do not want these conversations to happen. And statues are one of the mechanisms by which official versions of the past are literally set in stone. So they become the focus points of conflict. But I think these debates are not really about statues, they're battles of ideas. The removal of a statue in the street is theater. It's a symbolic, it's passionate, it's dramatic. It reminds me a bit of carnival a time when what was hidden spills into the streets and when underlying conflicts are performed in public spaces. It is an expression of living memory. But for people who want to hold on to and defend the status quo, statues are worth defending. And so worldviews clash and trenches are drawn around the plinths on which these memorials stand. Many people refuse to see the racism that lies in the defense of statues. Um, black lives didn't matter at the time that Picton statue was erected, at the time the monument was taken down and then re-erected. Even today, they don't matter enough to turn public spaces into anything less than a proud reminder of the violence perpetuated against black bodies. As governor of Trinidad, Picton increased the numbers of lashes given to slave, and yet we celebrate him as a hero. Black enslaved people's humanity names and histories lay forgotten while people still wring their hands and defend monsters like Picton as a war hero, choosing to forget his crimes, which even at his time were deemed unacceptable in favor of a fluffy warm feeling that the great version of British and Welsh history they choose to believe in gives them. It's another example of white comfort being at the center of decision-making and white discomfort being seen as a greater threat than dishonesty or racial injustice. We're looking here at what I call centering of whiteness 
as the norm, which is also apparent in historical arguments. The argument that we have to judge people according to their time doesn't refer to the judgment of black people of their time. It means we should still hold without question the views of certain white British and European colonizers of that time. The sad thing is the centrality of white arguments and memories is so anchored as the norm that most of us don't even see it. And there are ways of remembering that can reflect humanity and reflect on it, not rigid and one dimensional, but complex, able to transform and alive. Um, I touched briefly on carnival earlier or mass as it's called in Trinidad, which is a form of living memory. It's not top down, but bottom up, a form of resistance and rebirth through which people reconnect with their own spirit, humanity and culture. Not memories of the rich and powerful enshrined in stone, but memories of the suppressed that come out to breathe and dance in the streets. Carnival is a theater of the streets. It's a liminal celebration. Every year the costumes are designed in new, new songs are written. Carnival is a creative expression of memory, not preserved in a museum, but stored in the collective mind of the community. And in a sense, we're all caught up in a carnival or a masquerade at the moment. We're wearing our hats and masks and we're performing different sides of painful national memory that has to work its way back to the surface. It's that of colonialism and the UK's historical influence on the world. Our own suppressed cultural memories that were not taught in school are finding their way back into the national psyche and they are making statues dance and shake. People perform ideological battles online on Twitter and social media, and we're all drawn into this performance. I think it's a good thing. Change doesn't come quietly or softly. It comes with a lot of discomfort. And just as kind of as a time of liminality, when the world can change, I think we are in a liminal time today. And you don't need to push statues over to make a change. It's about conversations and sharing knowledge. And we need to keep engaging in these conversations, finding ways to talk and review what was once so solid. We have to help people understand that it's not about them. In the UK, highly edited histories continue to prop up a dangerous feeling of British exceptionalism. In 2016, Neil MacGregor, who was formerly the director of the British Museum and is currently the founding director of the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, spoke about the differences in how the British and the Germans look at their histories. In Britain, he said, we use our history in order to comfort us, to make us feel stronger, to remind ourselves that we were always, always deep down good people. But in the end, it's not histories and statues that make us good people. It's our own choices and actions. And as someone who works in informal education in the museum, I hold the opportunity to learn from history high, higher than any fool's respect for the past. I think continuous engagement is necessary to give heritage a value. Picton was forgotten in plain sight before the death of George Floyd, so a global move to greater honesty and social justice, which I hope will not just be temporary. Now we remember. And suddenly we see these monuments and remnants of colonialism all over the place. And perhaps that is their value. Maybe they waited patiently for this moment when they would come to the center of cultural debates before beginning to occupy a new space in our national consciousness. Maybe the purpose they were built for is not the purpose they are destined to fulfill. Perhaps they had to be made of stone and sit in public spaces until the UK was ready to confront its own massive problem of ingrained colonial thought and individual institutional racism. They had to be part of our landscape because they were part of our internal landscape all along. And the way they have become visible is part of a wider process perhaps, which I hope will see us try to remember rather than memorialize. And I'm very happy that I am able to be here today and to share this space where I hope this process um, is happening. So thank you. And I think Emily said, if there's any questions, then I'm happy to take them as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was just fantastic. Yeah, really, really brilliant. So many, I wrote lots of your lines down because they were so, so pertinent, like remembering more ethically. It's like, it sometimes feels very simple. I mean, I know it's not, it's complicated, but um, yeah. Just that, like, just, yeah. And, and that, that idea that these statues have been, been sort of 
becoming, you know, they, be, have, they became invisible part of the landscape, just sitting there waiting for this moment and representing something that's, you know, within us. That's very, very, you know, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> it's a very brilliant way of, way of looking at it. I would like to introduce our, um, our second speaker for this evening. Um, Vanda is a multimedia, multidisciplinary artist who works within a theoretical context of skin, the body and identity situated in the politics of place and gender. Since 2012, Vanda has been performing the annual collaborative protest, the H.M. Stanley Funeral Condom Reveiling. And I think we'll hear more about that in her talk. I certainly hope so. Over to you, Vanda. Thank you. No sweat our pub. Dwin Valkyan, he bored our mind and shared a bachi henoma and Sai Snake Mandrugani. I live in North Wales in Porthaythwy on Annis Morn, and I was asked to describe myself. I'm a white woman in my 60s with curly hair, half grey, half dark, uh, and I wear glasses. And I've got an orange jumper on and a badge that says not dead yet. So I was invited here tonight because of that sculpture. I'm going to turn on the share screen now. So I was invited tonight because of this sculpture that was erected in 2011 in Denby in Cluid. And um, I liked, I'm speaking really about using the monumental as an artistic strategy for change. This is a statue of Henry Morton Stanley, who was famous for his exploits in the Congo in the 19th century. And I was involved in a petition to stop this statue going up, which failed. And since then, I've been going to Denby every year with a group of supporters to perform a funeral protest and reveiling of this statue. And this will be the 10th year if it's not removed. Uh, which is long enough to make it a tradition, apparently. But I'll talk more about that later. But first, I'd like to take you back another 10 years, 20 years in total, the turn of the century, uh, when I first began to pay more attention to public art. And I asked myself, what is a monument? Who decides what goes up? Who pays for it? Why is it there? and who is represented? And how long will it be there? Does that matter? During an art project with Lindsay Colburn, who's here tonight, nice to see you, in Clandidno, I coined the term spontaneous memorializing to describe things like carving your name in a tree. We went for an eight hour long walk around Clandidno, looking for memorials to women. And we saw this field made over time by the people of Llandidno and called the Hill of Names. It's below the conservatory, the observatory. This seems to me to be the first need to leave a message over time saying I was here or commemorating a loved one or something important to you. The urge seems to become exploited, appropriated or corrupted by power and politics to hold many different kinds of meanings and messages to tell the people who are looking at them about the people who put them up and about the people they represent. This is the Pharaoh Hor Horemheb and the god Horus. The early Egyptians equated form with identity, believing that statues conferred immortality on the subject. Many people still seem to believe this touching the feet of statues, for example, so that the bronze in that, stuff, that spot becomes polished and looks like gold, like the one of Mary Seacole in Angela Maddox's talk. Or the stone can be worn away. The person lives on in their statue. There is a kind of power and magic in art that we ignore at our peril. Even when we're not really conscious of the public art around us, it's working its message on us. Rulers have always been aware of this 
especially totalitarian rulers. I think it's important to notice what is around us. The artist and theorist Simon O'Sullivan talks about art as an encounter that changes the viewer based on Deleuze's theory that something in the world forces us into thought. Now, I want to know what kind of social contract I'm being expected to accept. I noticed how much public art comprises statues of men. 97.5% of human statues in the UK are of men, almost all of them white. This one is Lloyd George in London. And this one is Henry Dundas, Viscount Melville, a Tory politician. I just picked this one in the first place because he has a really tall and imposing column, a phallic symbol, I thought, used in the visible demonstration of power and dominance. And then I looked him up. What type of person gets a memorial? He was the first Secretary of State for War and became, in 1806, the last person to be impeached in the United Kingdom for misappropriation of public money. Dundas was very active in opposing the abolition of slavery and in the expansion of British influence in India and in the affairs of the East India Company. He was nicknamed the Great Tyrant and the uncrowned King of Scotland. He is commemorated, oh sorry, I've, I've changed it too soon because I want to say a bit more about him. He's, this is one of the most prominent memorials in Edinburgh, the 150 foot high category A listed Melville Monument at St Andrews Square. And some people question why we remember so many horrible white men. Recently, Edinburgh City Council leader Adam McVeigh said he would feel no sense of loss if the statue of Henry Dundas was to be removed. But there are many forces in this country ranged against the removal of such monuments. This one is the Marquis of Anglesey's column in Llanfairpur-Gwingich, which looms over the village in the countryside near me, much of which he owned. This column is near my home. I frequently walk past it and can see it from almost anywhere. He was given the title because he lost his leg at the Battle of Waterloo, but he was already the Earl of Uxbridge. His family estates were about 30,000 acres, that's 120 square miles, uh, square kilometres, in Staffordshire, Dorset, Anglesey and Derbyshire, providing an annual income of 110,000, which is the equivalent today of 12 million pounds a year. The Marquis of Anglesey got a column and a statue for losing his leg, but ordinary soldiers get a slab with their name and dates on it, or a wooden cross. This is the military cemetery for Commonwealth soldiers of World War I and II in France. Dying in wars and disasters or disasters in large numbers is one way ordinary people get public memorials. And this is the World War I cemetery in Verdun. So I was becoming aware of the nature of many public statues and memorials and the lack of women in them. And I wanted to make some sort of intervention or statement about it. And around that time, I saw a very small sculpture at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park that had a big effect on me. In 1998, in Wellington, Virgin in a Condom, a sculpture just 7.5 centimetres high in the Te Pepe Gallery, divided Wellington for a turbulent six weeks, during which time seven people were arrested for violent protests. Catholic activists saw the artwork as an insult to their faith and applied for a court order injunction to have the work removed. Some tried more direct methods, one man kicking the statue in its perspex case to the ground, the first day it went on display, while another attacked it with a metal bolt. A third assaulted a Te Papa worker. 
Wellington woman Amanda Sutherland told the Dominion that Te Papa made a mockery of its name by refusing to remove the desecrated virgin. Te Papa means our container of treasured things and people that spring from Mother Earth here in New Zealand. To me, it held a lot of meanings. The problem of birth control for Catholics, but also the whole idea of the virgin, the way of looking at women as virgins or whores, the sort of female virtues that are seen as suitable to be put on a pedestal, and the containment and lack of exploration of female sexuality. I went to a convent school. Incidentally, Lyndon Mead wrote a book called The Female Nude in response to Kenneth Clark's popular book on the nude, in which he posits the female nude as the phallus of the male artist, because that's one place we do see a lot of women in public art, in museums and galleries, nameless and naked, standing for various values and beliefs held by men. I had begun working with recycled uh, rubber inner tubes for my master's degree, in which I did a project about appropriating the road, generally imagined as a masculine place in literature and art, with the wandering nomadic man hitting the road while the abandoned woman stays at home at the kitchen sink with the children. I'd like to think that this has changed somewhat, but when I think of programs like Top Gear and motorsports generally, I'm not so sure. The recycled rubber tubes are from bicycle tubes to big tractor and earth mover tubes, very heavy and industrial. Rubber is a medium that demonstrates the fundamental generative nature of matter to me as an artist, where the medium can be the origin and catalyst for ideas and action. The recycled rubber comes loaded with many meanings and transformations in its journey from tree sap to inner tube. The associations of rubber are mainly tactile ones, from sticky latex running down the tree bark to the mysterious alchemy of the vulcanization process in the factory. The smell of warm rubber, the soft flaccid empty tubes and the rigid air filled bladders of the inflated tube inviting touch. This slide is from a residency I did in Mexico about water. I made a very large sculpture filled with water, but due to language difficulties, I got the wrong sort of patches, which I used to join the seams between the inner tubes. They were tire patches that didn't stretch like tube patches. And when I filled it up, it started to leak in places, a sort of lucky accident in that wastage of water in poorly maintained waterways is a big problem in Mexico. I call this the sacred heart. I thought of putting rubber condoms on some other sort of sculptures than the Virgin Mary, on what I saw as phallic symbols of patriarchal power, as a symbol of protest and containment of that power to stop the spread of exploitation and imperialism. I thought I should apply to the Arts Council for a grant to cover the Marquis of Anglesey with a rubber condom. I would need a helicopter to get it up there. I made these virtual photographic images of condoms on various statues of imperialist men. And I also made one of the statue of Queen Victoria in Bath. Most of the few statues of women in the UK are women from the royal family, and most of them are of Queen Victoria, where she's mainly representing colonial wealth and power, inextricably linked to slavery and exploitation. When the Stanley sculpture went ahead and was erected in 2011, I wanted to cover it with one of my condoms, and this time I could do it in reality and without funding the only contemporary thing about this statue is the egalitarian way that it's not placed on a plinth so that you have to look up at it. It's at the same level as the people who are looking at it. 
Otherwise, it looks like a Victorian bronze. This meant that I could reach it to measure up for the making the condom and later to come back and try on the half finished rubber sculpture to check that it would fit. When Hugh Jones had asked me to sign the petition he was organizing against it, which was signed by several people from the Congo, I did some research about Stanley and the more I read, the more horrified I became. Unfortunately, some in Denby were convinced by a well-researched book by the revisionist historian Jim, Tim Geel, who was also the biographer of Baden Powell, that excuses Stanley as a man of his time and look no further in their desire to celebrate this famous local boy who was born in poverty and brought up in the workhouse as an example of poor boy made good. Stanley was born in Denby and abandoned by his unmarried mother, who was a chambermaid and looked after by his grandfather until he was five, when his grandfather died. He was put in the workhouse in St Asaph, where some sources say he was sexually abused. As soon as he could get out, he went to America and eventually became a journalist and a white explorer of lands already known by their indigenous populations. He was popular and a famous explorer who wrote highly coloured stories of his bravery. But the reality was that he got his results by brutal methods. Scores of his bearers died and he shot his way through any areas that tried to refuse him access. His most famous journey was up the Congo River to its source, opening up the heart of Africa when he became the agent of King Leopold II of Belgium, who was envious of the wealth brought in to the other colonial powers. Leopold was a clever businessman who turned the Congo into his own personal property under the cover of a private charity run by himself, whose only beneficiary was him and who became immensely rich. Between 1885 and 1908, the Congo Free State was the most brutal of all the colonial states, where between 10 and 15 million people died from murder, exhaustion, disease and starvation under his regime. King Leopold never visited the Congo, but Joseph Conrad did, and he wrote Heart of Darkness about what he saw there, which was an inspiration for the film Apocalypse Now. One of the most valuable commodities at that time was rubber for tires for the new vehicles. Rubber was called black gold and in the Congo it was collected in the wild rather than on plantations. I need to warn you that the next slide is upsetting so you, you might want to look away. The original inhabitants, the Congo people who didn't have guns, were enslaved and brutalized. Whole villages were killed when they objected and hands were severed as a proof of numbers killed and justification of using ammunition or for not reaching quotas of wild rubber. And often they took the hands of children as the adults needed to work. This type of punishment of the Congolese was so widespread that the hands became a sort of currency collected for their own sake Soldiers' pay was based on how many hands they gathered. The Congo is one of the richest countries in the world in terms of resources, but remains one of the poorest due to this legacy and the continued exploitation by the West. So the, the use of rubber for the reveiling condom was horribly appropriate. Because of this history, I made a wreath also out of rubber for the people of the Congo who were killed, repurposing the statue as a memorial for the dead. Holding the wreath is Sal Williams, an environmentalist and political activist who has been one of the organisers of the protest against the statue right from the beginning. And he frequently speaks at the annual reveilings. Thank you, Sal. We carry the condom slowly through the streets of Denby 
in a funeral procession to the memorial, to the memorial with musicians playing funereal music. I think of it as something like a New Orleans funeral. Every year we give out leaflets telling something of the real history of Stanley and the Congo. And I tried to go up to Denby the week before to leave leaflets in the cafes, shops and library to tell people, to let people know we're coming. I think this year in this photo was the first year we did it. And my filing is pretty shameful, but I can work it out by the length of my hair in the photographs and the introduction of new elements like the text on the plinth and gradually we all began to wear more funereal costume. I think that was started by Lisa on the left in the black coat. Each year we found that the ceremony moved us more than the previous one. It never became routine, but seemed to gain meaning to the participants every time. Each year I read more books and discovered new horrors. I also became more interested in the politics of contemporary African countries, especially as my son lives in Malawi with his two children and previously in Zambia, which borders onto the Congo. Incidentally, you can just see, if it's not blocked by photographs of people, at the top right of this photograph, part of the Denby War Memorial. The other statue in, in the uh, place of the square in Denby. On top of the plinth with the names of the fallen is a statue of peace, visualized as a woman with wings, an angel in a thin classical shift. An example of the ways anonymous women can be seen in public art as allegorical symbols. The art historian Jill Perry cites the Statue of Liberty as a supreme example of woman as the empty vessel for patriarchal meaning. You can even climb up inside her body and look out over New York and America through her eyes. The plinth in front of the statue merely says, Dr. Livingston, I presume, referencing Stanley supposedly saying this on finding the lost Livingston on the shores of Lake Tanganyika, where Livingston had made his home. I made a replacement text to go over the plinth, which tells more of the history. Maya, one of the Denby supporters, is carrying it. On arrival, we reveil the statue with the condom, which is hard work because the rubber is so heavy and cumbersome. And then I place the sleeve over his arm. I had a red inner tube, so I made the hand out of it to represent the red hand of guilt. We've now started wearing red gloves for the performance. Once the reveiling is complete, the wreath is laid, and then we have speeches and singing and handing out leaflets and talking to anybody who wants to for about an hour. And then we take it all down and go home until the next year. Over the years of doing this durational performance, I've often thought about what should be the fate of the statue and of my corresponding artwork. The two works have existed together for all this time. And although my artwork is only there for one day each year, it has arguably had as much influence over the people who have seen it as the bronze monument. Many people who we have given leaflets to and talked to in Denby said they had never thought about the statue and knew nothing of its history. Two years ago, one of the supporters of the statue who had been consistent, consistently against us, said to one of our members who lives in Denby, they're right, aren't they? This shows that durational artwork can have an influence over time in a way that artwork seen only once may not have, and also points in a different way to the importance of what we choose to remember. We have always been respectful of the statue and careful not to damage it so as not to antagonise the people of Denby more than we already do. And I sometimes felt we should do something more radical, like sawing off one of its hands. Yet when its future came under discussion last year, I found myself with mixed feelings. Its existence and our protest 
had raised many discussions about the issues that otherwise would not have taken place. The council put it to the vote, the choices being taking it down or keeping it with the option of movement to a museum with contextual writing. In the latter case, I, suge I suggest my contemporaneous condom sculpture must go with it for the full story of this ill thought out monument to be told. If not, the visual power of the whitewash continues unchallenged. The vote was split, so they're putting it to a public vote this year. The recent actions of BLM protesters tearing down statues such as that of the slave owner Edward Colston has drawn public attention to memorials in the UK as never before. On 7th of June 2020, the statue of slave trader Edward Colston was toppled from its plinth by protesters and thrown into Bristol Harbour. Jen Reed climbed onto the empty plinth during the protest and stood with her fist raised in a black power salute. The artist Mark Quinn secretly made and erected this statue on the 15th of July, only one week later. Bristol City Council removed the statue the next day. But the mayor of Bristol asked Quinn to donate it to the museum. Quinn has given them a maquette, a small version of the statue. The statue of Jen Reed is called a surge of power and it's made of resin and steel. Quinn met Jen Reed and asked her to reenact the pose and she was scanned by Quinn and it was printed. So I think 30 printed sections in plastic uh, were, were made before it was cast in, it was 3D printed in resin and reinforcing steel. If it had been made permanent, Quinn would have liked it to be cast in bronze. Quinn called it a collaborative sculpture by himself and Jen Reed, as she made the original image in her performative protest. If sold, the money would go to two charities of Jen's choice. Three years before that, in 2017, a crowd of white supremacists held a rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. One of them plowed his car into a crowd of anti-racist demonstrators, causing mass injuries and killing Heather Heyer, a 32-year-old paralegal. A petition was started saying that the statue of General Robert E. Lee, a commander of the Confederate States Army and a slave owning anti-abolitionist should be removed and a statue of Heather Heyer should be placed there in its stead. The town agreed to drape black cloth over the statues of Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson in a reveiling or shrouding to mourn the loss of Ms. Heyer, but protested, insisted, it was not enough at the city council meeting. Arguments like this about Confederate statues in the US, although highlighted and revitalized by the death of Heather Heyer and more recently, the Black Lives Matter movement and death of George Floyd have been going on in the Southern states since the 1960s civil rights movement. And strangely, like the Stanley statue, Many of those Confederate statues are also fairly recent, being erected in the 1950s and 60s. And they also look much older than they are or were because several have been taken down recently. So why are so many contemporary memorials old fashioned, conservative and even Victorian in appearance? It's almost as if they use the artistic language of a previous era to disguise the fact that they were erected in a supposedly more enlightened age. Gillian Waring is an English conceptual artist, one of the young British artists and winner of the Turner Prize in 1997. She normally does conceptual work such as this, where she asked passers-by to write down whatever they wanted as alternative signs. I don't know if you can read them both. The one on the right says, the last holiday abroad was nice, 
but I can't afford it. I think you can see that the one on the left says, I like to be in the country. This statue of the suffragist Millicent Fawcett is now in Parliament Square. Fawcett is the first woman memorialised in Parliament Square and Waring is the first female sculptor to have a sculpture there. It is bronze and realistic. The most contemporary looking component is the large banner she is holding. Do memorials need to look like the person they represent and be in traditional materials? Are artists who are making sculptures about more radical subjects, perhaps using this visual language as a sort of strategy to get past the senses? Just as the long battle to get the statue of Millicent Fawcett erected was finally won, a nearby statue of Emmeline Pankhurst came under threat. It currently stands near Parliament Square in London's Victoria Tower Gardens, close to the Palace of Westminster. Funded by the suffragettes, there have been plans to move it to, private, to a private site in Regent's Park, Regent's University in Regent's Park. So it seems that any gains for representation and equality may be only short-lived. On the 8th of March 2019, a statue of Emmeline Pankhurst was unveiled in Manchester's St Peter's Square to mark International Women's Day. This was the first statue of a Pankhurst in Manchester, where they come from. In Wales, there's been a campaign by Dr Jasmine Donahay calling from a, for a debate on the lack of statues for notable women in Wales. The Welsh nurse Betsy Cadwallader has no statue. Angela Maddox spoke about her in her talk about Mary Seacole. Her name today is mostly synonymous with the Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board, the largest health organisation in Wales and associated with a failing service. In 2016, she was named as one of the 50 greatest Welsh men and women of all time and was placed on that list in importance ahead of such famous Welsh men as the singer Tom Jones, the actor Anthony Hopkins, T.E. Lawrence and Ivan Novello. Yet all of those men have statues to them. And out of the 50 greatest Welsh men and women of all time, only six women were on the list. In Denmark, a substantial statue of a black woman who led an uprising of plantation workers in the Caribbean has been erected. Created by black women artist Gina Ellers, uh, Ellers, I'm not sure if I can pronounce her name, and Lavorne Bell, it represents a powerful leader rather than an abject victim. I Am Queen Mary demonstrates the concept of monumentality used as a strategy for combating erasure, an aesthetic approach that uses the possibilities of composition to shape our consciousness of form in ways that relate to subject construction. The monumental quality comes partly from the large scale and partly from the composition and pose of the model, referencing classical figures as well as a photograph of a black, of black Panther leader, Huey P. Newton, on a round-backed, outsized wicker chair, which actually is something like, it reminds me of the, the, the round disc behind Mary, the Mary Seacole uh, statue in, in uh, London. And I wonder if, if, they'd seen, if they'd seen that or it was just a coincidence. What destabilizes the monumental quality and gives its gives it its contingent or potential aspect is the fact that this is an impoverished black woman holding the tools of her labor as if they are a scepter and a ceremonial weapon, wearing rags with imperial pride and confidence. The collaborative sculpture by Ellis, who's Danish, and Bell from the Virgin Islands uses the scale, symbolism, and dignitas of monumental form 
to challenge Denmark's role in slavery and its commemoration of a colonial past. Instead, it celebrates a leader of those who fought against it. But like the sculpture by Mark Quinn, this statue is made of resin and steel, not bronze, and its future is uncertain. I'm a member of several collectives of women artists who identify as older, committed to the collaborative performance of gender, feminism and ageing. And we've also explored the dynamic and transformative interaction of performance art with memorials. The group called XX Centenary made a performance about a statue at the Buzz Cup Festival in uh, Glasgow in 2017. The image that we are all holding in front of our faces is the only image we could find of Lady Dinah Elizabeth Pierce, a philanthropist who built the Pierce Institute in 1906 and gave it as a gift to the people of Govan. Lady Pierce gave generously to charity supporting returning soldiers, disabled children and the poor. She was a pioneer of the Fresh Air Fortnight Scheme, which sent hundreds of sick children to convalesce at the coast or in the countryside. She paid for this statue of her husband to be erected, yet there is no monument to her and she's often forgotten and overlooked. The statue of Sir William Pierce, who was the manager of the leading shipbuilding company Fairfield Shipyard, occupies a prominent position on the junction of Burley Street and Govan Road across from the Pierce Institute. In 1918, Lindsay Colburn, Lisa Hudson and I did a project called Girls and a Garage, a socially engaged product project where we made a map of Clandidno. Actually, Lindsay made the map. You can see it on the left there, the beautiful map, and tried to put women on it. People were invited to make mini sculptures of women they thought should be memorialized in Clandidno. We collected their stories and marked where they belonged on the map. We took the memorials around Clandidno in a procession <clears throat> and placed them where we thought they should go. Here's one of the placed mini sculptures. And finally, I'd like to tell you about a performance I made with XX Centenary for three weeks again in Glasgow at the Glasgow International Festival in 2018. Our project was called Not Dead Yet, and it was based at the Glasgow Necropolis, where we are in this photograph. The Glasgow Necropolis is a beautiful Victorian cemetery covering a small hill near the centre of Glasgow. You would expect a cemetery at least to have equality of numbers in the dead represented there, <clears throat> but this is not the case. Almost all the memorials in the necropolis are to men. All of the big ones are. We had a, a social hub nearby that we called the One Stop Memorial Shop, where we held workshops about death and dying. We had death yoga on Saturdays, workshops making alternative morning jewelry and puppets. Uh, we had rebirthing sessions in a soft coffin where you could experience a near death uh, experience and get older. And we had a poetry corner provided by the Scottish Poetry Library, where you could read books about dying and grief and writing sessions with poets. On Sundays, we did various performances at the Necropolis. <clears throat> we made critical interventions at the memorials to some of the men. For example, this is the grave of Charles Tennant whose bleach factory in the valley below the necropolis polluted the whole valley and killed many of his workers. We also impersonated the man spreading statue of him on his memorial and we staged temporary memorials for forgotten women of Glasgow around the, uh, the, the cemetery. This is one of our alternative morning clothes workshops 
in the One Stop Memorial Shop, where we made funeral clothing for our final performance at the Necropolis. We had made a banner saying not dead yet. And many of the women we had met at the various workshops came with us to the Necropolis for our last performance, followed by a wake back at the non-stop memorial shop. Given our subject matter, we decided a wake at the end of the project would be more appropriate than an opening night. In her writing about monumentality, Anka Christopher Beachy points to the human body's resistance to being framed by restrictive categories, to being immobilized into fixed forms. She proposes a precarious and mutable monumentality that rather than reinforcing patriarchal and racist values might lead to transformation, inclusivity and change. Thank you so much, Vanda. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I love that you you brought in gender and age, and you know had this. You've got this real intersectional way of looking at things, which is really really great. We haven't done that so much on this project, so that was really great to have that to have that brought in. Um, and it really struck me the kind of the power of durational artworks just like keeping on doing it um and yeah that was that was really it was really lovely to hear your stories about that and how it changed every time the condom revealing um and uh, it reminded me this week i i watched a film about donna haraway who is an amazing thinker and writer and academic somebody who who i love very much and in the film she says she talks about how you need more than a critique of whatever it is, you know, you need to offer up a new story. And I think it feels like your work really does that. It doesn't just critique, it's like, let's let's go and do this. Let's, you know, it kind of gets busy. And um, that really, that really appeals to me. I also just feel like, can I take part? <laughs> <laughs> I really have that feeling of like, yeah, I want to get involved in this. <laughs> it involves dressing up and yeah. And um, although obviously at the same time, you know, you talked about really big, terrible, horrific subjects of brutalizing of black bodies, you know, just hot, terrible, terrible episodes of, of British history. Um, but you know, there's it's a, there's a, it's all in there. You manage to to get it all in there, um, and that's really lovely to see those things. I would just like to thank massive thanks to Vanda and to Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for staying up late in Kenya to to carry on the conversations. Really brilliant to see you there. Um, thank you to our funders, Heritage Lottery and Cadu. Big, big thanks to Chris uh, for your technical support. Um, thanks to our volunteers, although you didn't have much to do <laughs> this evening because we didn't get to go into breakout rooms. Um, and as usual, a big thanks to all my colleagues at Oria Martin Gallery for everything that you do behind the scenes and to Paula and Lisa at Carmarthen School of Art. Um, thank you all for coming. Diolch an fawr i dod. Goodbye, hoi and stay safe. <laughs>